that preacher back on the air again. So guys, call someone and get yourself the things that you need in order to prepare to be able to receive the word of God. So get you a pad, whatever your choice, your phone, whatever your choice or device that you use to study the word of God. We have two minutes and this train is pulling out of the station. Y'all know exactly what we're starting off with. Let's start into the Word of God with prayer as we're always doing. We're going from the natural realm into the spiritual realm, so let us go by crying for spiritual help as we go forward. Father, we honor you, we bless you, and we thank you for this opportunity you have given us once again to come before the throne of grace. We thank you, Lord, that there's nothing that we can possibly do that it will be so good that will give us such a privilege. But it's just your mercy, your kindness, your love, Lord, that is everlasting, that we come before the throne of grace and we are able to say, Father, we thank you and we bless you, Lord. I pray that you bless the minds of the servants of yours right now, that our hearts and minds may be ready to receive thy word. I bind, Lord God, any demonic spirit that comes up with the plans of trying to distract our minds from hearing that which you have called us to do. Oh, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus that you bless us, that we may stay focused. Let us do what we can according to thy word, Lord. After we have done all we know to do to stand, let us stand, Lord. So let us do everything that we can to remove any distraction. Put the, the phones on silent. Cut off the TVs, Lord. Remove ourselves from anybody, Lord God, that may begin to talk and would take our mind away from the word of God that you're trying to give to thy people. Lord, I pray that you bless us, that we may stay focused, that the things that we may hear, Lord, that we may immediately, Lord, get down in our spirit, resonate in our spirit that we may grow in through and by thy word. Lord, I pray that you bless the saints that are right here. Keep them in the moment to the saints, Lord, that will be coming in shortly, Lord. I pray that you get them to a safe place and destination, that they are able to sit down, Lord, and Hear the word of God and apply this word to their lives and to those who will not be here with us for whatever reason. I plead the blood of Jesus, Lord, that you bless them, Lord, that at a later date they may be able to view the message, find out what is it that you have in it for them, and then take the message, Lord, and apply it to their lives that we may see the benefit thereof. Oh, Father, we thank you. And so with that said, I stand, Lord God, with their own Lord God mindset, with this mindset of saying, I, by my own free will, will give the Holy Spirit the power of attorney over the message. Let him freely go through this message and bless it, Lord God, that he may be able to break it down to the least form, Lord, that even the most meager, simple among us will be able to understand it. Now, I thank you for hearing this prayer. Now, I believe by faith that you have honored this request, for this is a prayer that I ask the Holy Spirit to deliver to the Father, for it is both in the name and under the blood of our Lord and our Savior, for you are Jesus you are the Christ. 
So Lord, we thank you and we honor you for this time, guys. I have four, uh, just give me a few minutes of your time and I promise you, we're going to get through this thing. The time is already set for me and we are rolling forward from there. Now, guys, what we want to do is get into the word of God to find out exactly what it is that God is asking of us. Find out what is it that God wants us to understand. Now, we are deep into the book of Acts. We are all the way into Acts, the 26th chapter. And so that's where you're going, saints, Acts, the 26th chapter. And so what we did, we left off at last week. We did some studying and was beginning to really go into the word of God to find out exactly what it is that God is saying to us. And Paul has a scenario that he is going through, saints. And so what we want to do with Paul, we want to be able to take and find out exactly what it is that Paul is dealing with with at the time. Remember, it is a courtroom setting. There are some high-powered people that are there. You have Festus, which is the Romans. Uh, if you would, he would be the person for Rome that is overlooking this whole province and is trying to keep the peace. And so with this is taking place, there is an uproar that has happened. Festus wants to keep the peace. He heard Paul's situation and circumstance. Then he said, well, no, 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 I'm not going to just allow this to happen. But then come to find out that Paul had dual citizenship. Not only was he a Jew, but he was a Roman. And so therefore, Festus was not just allowed to let the Jewish people kill him without a true trial. And so Festus Festus has this whole situation and looking at it and dealing with it, wants to make a good um, scene of himself being there. And now he has King Agrippa that is coming in and he says to his friend Agrippa, listen, I don't know too much about you guys' customs and things of this sort, but what I want to do is I want you to hear this case and you tell me what you think, because I cannot send this man to Rome for a trial and don't have nothing that he is accused of. I would look like I, don't know, I do not know how to handle my province and take care of this situation. That may not look favorable to Caesar. And so I need you to hear this out. Tell me what it is that is going on, and I can then be able to have something to write and tell them about. Now, in the midst of all of this, so you have Festus for the Roman situation, and you have the Roman guards there. You had now King Agrippa and pomp and circumstances of all of the people that come with a king in town. You had governors there, and you also had guys, um, the chief priests and his people that are making the accusation. So in that day and time, it would have been like a who's who in that province coming at Paul, and Paul is sitting in the midst of it, and he is proclaiming Jesus and him crucified. So what you need to do what I need to do is regardless of the status of a person we need to proclaim Jesus and him crucified you are not to back up you are not to back down don't give in and don't you give out at all with what God has called you to do let it fly people you tell them exactly what it is that God has told you to tell them and the rest leave you up to God let God do what God do your job is just to proclaim what God has given you and I assure you God will back what you say for everything you say that is according to God's word, God will back it. So that's what we were, guys, we were picking up. And so we last left off, we had gotten down to um, verse number 16. Um, it was about five verses. So I'm going to read from 16 down to 20, and then we're going to pick up from there, guys. This is our ever-popular slingshot effect. Y'all know how this works, guys. We go back and we, um, a slingshot, you pull it back, and the further back you pull it, the more tension you're going to get and it's going to go off and it's going to shoot the new information. So let's go, um, go over the past information that we had. So Romans, um, I'm going to say Acts, the 26th chapter, verse number 16, it says, it says, but arise and stand upon thy feet for I have a point uh, Appointed unto, appointed unto thee this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both to these things which thou hast seen and of those things which those things which I will appoint unto do, appear unto thee. It says, Deliver, um, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I, uh, whom I now send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, and they and, and they may receive. That they, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance amongst them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient upon the heavenly vision, but showed, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should 
repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And so that's what Paul was beginning to, um, he is sitting there. And again, King Agrippa is listening to all of this. Now, one thing we do know, guys, King Agrippa knew the Jewish laws. He knew the Jewish custom because King Agrippa being a Jew, he fully understood the things that Paul was talking about. And so what you had here is Paul was beginning to proclaim this thing and he's standing on the word of God. And so some things that we grab from it is in verse number 16, he was saying, now that God has gotten you um, gotten your attention, um, he can now tell you what to do. And so what he did with Paul, Paul was giving his his scenario here, giving his account of what had happened. That's what he was saying is in 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I would appear unto thee, upon unto thee uh, for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both to these things which are seen, which thou have seen, and those things which thou which thou and those things into which I will appear unto thee. So what he is saying to you is, okay, get up. Now that God has put you on your back, we learned last week, God has put you on your back, and now what he wants you to do is, he's gotten your attention, told you what to say, now get about your business. And so we learned that the God has gotten about, um, Paul is getting about the business of God, and we learned he started right there. He didn't mess around with waiting until he got himself together. He just started telling people of what he knew. Now, here are some things you need to understand. You may not be a preacher. You may not be a pastor. You may not be a elder. You may not be a bishop. All you know is what you know. You tell people what you know and the rest God will give you to know a little more. But when you do nothing, God will do nothing. So you use what you have and then God will give you a little more to use. And so the thing that we have is so many people say, well, I don't know too much about the word of God, so I'm not going to say nothing. Well, say something about what you do know. And the rest, leave it up to God from that point. And so all you do is when you begin to tell more about what you know, you will learn more so you can tell a little more. And so that's what we're looking at right there. Paul, um, he is telling you, now you just do what you can. And Paul started right there with the people he knew in his little province that he was in. And then he branched out to tell other people, listen, some people may have heard your testimony, but everybody has not heard it. You should have your testimony ready on your lips to be able to tell about what God has done for you, where God has brought you, how God has brought you out, how God has delivered you. I can tell your testimony, but I cannot tell your testimony like you. And so you got to be ready to tell about the things that God has done for you. The creator and the maker of everything has done so much for you. And yet and still, you're afraid to tell people, but you don't want to get offended. You don't want to offend people. It's amazing to me how we would look at our favorite football team, basketball team, baseball team, track star, and you have all of the statistics and stats on this person. You are able to spit them out as if you was the one that written them. And yet and still, you all know these things and learn these things about people, but you won't learn about the word of God. You won't learn about the God that will help you and deliver you through. So your testimony, you should be ready to tell someone about that. And that's what we learn, guys, as we begin to deal, deal with that. And so we learned in the midst of all of this, there's going to be people that's going to try to stop you and try to stop what God wants to do through you or try to belittle you or shame you. But what you're going to have to do is love the Lord with all thy heart, strength, soul, and might, and then let God do the rest. Okay, so with that said, saints, we have now gone back and we have covered up to where we are now, okay? I'll try to speed through that many times. i got to slow it up so I can make sure that uh, you get it. But that's what we have done. We have now already cleared that up. Now let's move to new information. So Acts, the 26th chapter, verse number 21. And now we're going to go into new information, okay? New information. That's what Paul has done, Clear these things up. So verse number 21, he says, For this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. And so Paul was beginning to tell King, and he's speaking, remember, he's speaking to King Agrippa. King Agrippa is the power there. He and Festus. Festus was of Rome, and this is his province. But King Agrippa is this king over this whole of the Jewish situation. And so he is pleading with King Agrippa and making his story known. And he is telling them, I started right where I was at, going back just a little bit to verse 20. Look at what he said. But show first, again, verse number 20, this is what Paul is speaking to King Agrippa. He's saying, but show first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and through Throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and know 
and, and do works meet for repentance. Now, back to 21. So that's what he is saying. I was in the temple. I was about God's business is what he was saying. So my question to you, are you about God's business? See, that shows that if you're doing God's business, you're still going to be tried. The devil is always going to come at you. The word says when I was to do good, evil was always present. This is an all-out fight, and the devil wants to make sure you understand. This ain't going to be no easy win. But God tells you that if you just fight the good fight of faith, you will win if you don't quit. But so many of us get fatigued and tired. We get tired of going through and being picked out or picked out to be picked on, to be losing a job or whatever or losing status because you stand for Jesus. But here's one thing you have to understand. The word of God tells you no matter what you lost, you lost, no, there's no man that has lost father or mother, um, pretty much job, no matter what you lost for the kingdom of God's sake, God says you're going to receive it back. You're going to receive it in spades. Trust me, God has a warehouse that's loaded down for you in heaven. You just keep honoring God. And so Paul is telling King Agrippa and Festus, he said, for this cause, the Jews caught me in the temple. What was he about? God's business. Where are they going to catch you at? Everybody's so careful about, I don't, want, uh, I don't want nobody to know I'm here creeping. Well, if you're where you're supposed to be, you should be able to talk loud. You should be able to boast and proclaim. And that's what he's saying. For this cause, the Jews caught me in the temple, in God's house, doing what I'm supposed to do. What was he doing? Proclaiming and telling them about Jesus. He says, and went about to kill me. So I was not doing nothing but in the temple talking about Jesus. You got some people that's going to hate on you because you're doing what God has told you to do. So in the temple, doing what he's supposed to do, the Jews came into the temple. They didn't come to hear from God. They didn't come to know what God's will was. They came in for one purpose and one purpose alone. And that was to catch Paul and try to kill him. Because he was proclaiming the word of God. The devil can threaten you, but he can do no more to you than what God allowed. So what you have to do is trust God and believe God every step of the way. So that's what you have to do. Be what God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do, and God will protect you and take care of you. As long as you are where God wants you to be and you are doing what God has called you to do, I promise you, God will take care of you. Nothing can happen to you before your time. So what you have to do is trust God. In 22, he says, he said, having therefore obtained help of God. See, that's exactly what I was just saying. He was where he was supposed to be, doing what he was supposed to do. They came in the house of God to kill him. And he said, having therefore obtained help of God, God got him out of this. He says, I continued unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say unto, say it shall come. So Paul is saying, God took care of me. And he said, I continue doing what God called me to do. See, the safest place to be is in the will of God, and God's will is his word. So when you're in the word of God doing what thus says the Lord, it's no matter, no matter where they catch you at, God's got you. God's got you. But this is what he said, God. He said, I continue to this day, witnessing both too small and great. Listen, don't you ever look at a person and say this person is not worth talking to. That's why here at Firm Foundation, I love the word of God and love people. If we, everybody know what time we start service. Sunday mornings, we start at 10 a.m. I don't give a dog on if there's one person sitting in here and everybody didn't show up. We're not going to wait for you. We, this boat pulled out at this boat pulled out at 10 a.m. For we have learned, guys, and one thing we teach to be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late. And to be late is unacceptable. You know what time you start work. You don't wake up if you got to be to work at 7. You don't wake up at 7 and say it's time to go to work. No, you get up early. You get yourself prepared, and then you get to work. At 7 o'clock, you should be already sitting in your seat. But the point you will find is many people, many saints, they want to give God the least. But listen what Paul is saying. When you're doing what God has told you to do, remember that. And you are what God has told you to be. God is going to back you. Again, listen what he's saying. Now, this is important. He's saying um, right there in verse number 22, he says, having therefore obtained help of God, that's to help him out of them wanting to kill him. He says, I continue unto this day. God helped me, so I stayed about what God has called me to do. Listen what he says. Witnessing both to small and great, 
Again, I say, don't you just, it's amazing how some people, how the devil will take that small and great and play with it. Yet you sit with your boss, you sit with that person of power, and you're afraid to climb up and tell them about Jesus because you don't want to offend them. You finna not offend them right into hell. But then you see a small person, meaning a person that don't have any authority or power, and you act like they ain't worth telling the word of God to. No, 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 you're getting it all wrong. It don't matter who you're talking to, small or great, status or no status, with the same passion and love, you should tell them about Jesus, and you will find out that Jesus will bless you tremendously. But if you're one that's just looking and saying in this whole situation that you're going to be um, one of those that, that, that I'm only going to look at people or go to people that are um, people that has a status about themselves, you're going to find out that you're always going to find you have respect the person. That's what you have, respect the person. And God has no respect for people that have respect the person. You never know who's going to be the next Billy Graham. You never know who's going to be the next Paul. You never know who's going to be the next this or that. So the only thing you do is talk about the love of Jesus and what Jesus done for you. I oftentimes ask this question. Everybody know Billy Graham, but do anybody know who led Billy Graham to Christ? See, there was a business um, in the business community. It was called MLM, multi-level marketing. And the process was this person, your job was to recruit all of these people up under you. So when they sell something, you get a portion of what they sold. Because you got them. Well, just imagine if God did MLM in the spiritual realm. So the people you led to Christ, as they're going out trying to reach their souls, God says, I'm going to give you a credit because you say you um, led this person to me. And so they don't want souls. And so therefore, I'm going to give you a portion for those souls. What would be in your account if God did that? Who have you led to Christ? Who is it that you have told about the goodness of Jesus? If God was to do such a thing, what is it? See, many people quit the MLM because they don't have the hustle to be able to keep working and working and working. You got to keep working in this thing, baby. You cannot sit back on your laurels and act like you, it's all okay. But Paul is dealing with some massive information here. Look at the information that Paul is saying. You need to see this. He says, again, he says, both small and great, saying no other thing than those, than those which the prophets and Moses did say shall come. And so what is Paul talking about? What is it that Paul is saying when he is talking to them? He is sitting before King Agrippa. He is for the high priest. He is before Festus. He is before, in that case, the religious body. He says, all this junk y'all talking and mad at me, I'm only saying what the, what the prophets and what um, Moses said should happen. So let's look at what he was quoting. Go with me, guys, if you will, to Isaiah. Isaiah, the sixth, the ninth chapter. Go to Isaiah, the ninth chapter. This is what he was saying pertaining to verse number 22. In Isaiah, in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, this is what Paul is saying. Isaiah 9 and, come on, where we at? There we go. Isaiah 9 and go to verse number 6. Look at verse number 6. Isaiah 9 and 6. This is what he was saying. All the things that the prophets all the things that the prophets and Moses was talking about. He said, I haven't said anything out the way. What was he saying? This is what the prophet said. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government should be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of, of, it says, of the increase of his government and peace there should be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to, or, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even from even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So this is what Paul said. Now you got that Isaiah 9 and um, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Now go back, guys, to um, Acts. Go back to Acts, the 26th chapter. And drop and back to where we were, Acts 26 and 22. 
And so that's what he is saying. He says, this is right here. Um, again, he said, I'm saying no more than what the prophets and Moses have said. The government has already told you. This is what I'm saying. The government should be a child is born. A son is given. And his name should. And he said, this is the Jesus I'm telling you about. This is what Isaiah was saying. This is what Isaiah was pleading to you guys about. This is what Isaiah was trying to foretell you that was coming. And I'm, I'm, all the thing I'm telling y'all is y'all missed it. You missed it. And you're angry at me. Again, look again, God. So he's saying, I, um, um, 20, um, 22nd chapter, and he says, having therefore, obta uh, having therefore obtained help of God, I continued, I continued unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, um, saying none other than the things which um, the prophets and Moses uh, did, um, did say shall come. And so what is it that the prophets and Moses was talking about? And he's telling us the hope that the Jewish people was looking for was the Messiah. But Isaiah told you he wasn't coming on that donkey that you were saw, or this horse in great power. He came lowly and humbled. And so that's why he's saying, for unto us a child is born. Unto us, um, unto us, a son is given. That lets you know not only a child was born, but it was a male child. It says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of his increase of his government, there shall be no end. So God says when Jesus come, when the Messiah come, he shall rule forever and no one should be able to stop him. No one should be able to hold back what he was doing and who he is. Nobody's going to be able to stop Jesus. They can try to delay it, but they cannot deny it. And the problem that we have many times, you think people have more power than they actually have. But what you need to understand is no greater power than Christ Jesus our Lord. And so you need to understand that, grasp that, and hold that dear to your life. And so this is what Paul is saying. King Agrippa, we have all been preaching and proclaiming this is going to come. But then when it gets here, they don't want to accept that it is here. You have some people that's okay with what might be. Never want to see that it is. Therefore, they won't deal with it. But God is saying to you, okay, your life, I have pulled you out the gutter. And I need you to tell the story of your life. But many people are going to get mad at you. But God says, don't worry about it. I will protect you. I just need you to continue telling the story of how I delivered you. Because if God did it for you, he can do it for someone else. And so he's saying, you need to understand. All of this time, y'all been proclaiming and preaching and talking about it. And now that I'm telling you, it is here. You don't want to accept it. There are some people that always want to tell about the Messiah that's going to come. And the reason they keep they okay with the, telling you about the Messiah that's going to come, because when he come, he has a standard that he expects everyone to live by. And then people don't want that because they're held accountable. And people don't want to be accountable because everybody wants to be a God in their own eyes. But we have to trust God and believe him every step of the way. So Paul is laying this thing down in the word of God. He is saying, no, no, no. I'm not just spitting off at the mouth saying something crazy. I'm proclaiming the word of God according to the prophets and Moses. And if you're going to get mad at me for proclaiming what God has said via the prophets and Moses, your argument is not with me. It's with the prophets and Moses. So you stand up and fight against them, not me. There are some people that do not like you because you'll stand for Christ. It is not you they don't like it's Christ that you're proclaiming they don't like because it is Christ that is putting the light on them it is Christ that's putting the light on their life so they think by killing the messenger you stop the message but killing the messenger don't stop the message God will send another messenger to proclaim his word before you and to you and lay this thing before you. And so that's what you are beginning to find out right there. So he stood with the proclaiming by the prophets and by Moses. And so he said, you deal with the written word. That's what Paul was saying. Your argument is you deal with the written word and let God do the rest. But I'm telling you, I'm standing on solid ground. Remember, Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. So he knew the Torah. He knew the law. He knew the word, people. And so they could not argue with him based on the word because Paul, by one, knowing the word, 
He's able to say, no, this is what the word says. And I'm proclaiming to you that Jesus fulfilled that. And here is why. Because Jesus, um, if you would, you may say, well, Jesus can, they say, was a false prophet. He can fake this and fake that he was saying. But at his birth, certain things had to line up in the heavens, the stars. It did. At his birth, certain things had to be going on on earth. It was. At his birth, certain things had to be proclaimed and said. There had to be certain things people were looking for, and it was. So all of these he fit. So the question you have to ask to the scribes and Pharisees and all of them, what, he, he, a newborn baby, changed the stars the way he wanted them to? He was in a certain geographical area that had to be? Certain things that was going on that had to be going on because at that time, the reason Jesus was in the area that he is because Rome had proclaimed, uh, Rome had taken more of the land and they wanted taxes. And so the taxes, you had to go back to where you was born. And so what they had to go back is to Nazareth. Hence the word of God saying he shall be called a Nazarene. So all of this stuff was laid down before Jesus even got here in the natural so he's saying, I'm doing nothing but proclaiming, nothing but what the word of God says. So are you mad at me or are you mad at the word? Verse number 23, he says that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that's, that should raise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. See, the problem was the Jews just had, they look clicked together. They had the word, God spoke to them. We are God chosen people, so therefore we have everything. And they did not want anything to go to the Gentiles. There are people that have gifts. There are people that have great things. They won't use it and don't want nobody else to use it either. A thing that you have, many people in their homes, you go look in their homes, it's some amazing, beautiful stuff that they have. I'm going to put it out one day. You won't use it, but you won't sell it. And the house is getting clogged up with more and more junk. You have people that have gifts of God and they're crying and looking at somebody else's gift in envy and jealousy because they want to have the same, if you would, anointing, but you won't use the gift that God has given you. And so Paul is proclaiming, now he is on a roll right here. He's talking about Moses and the prophets, and so therefore they got to deal with that. But he didn't let up. He stayed on it right here. He kept his foot on the gas right here. Look at what he says. For Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should raise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So he's saying he's going to suffer. He's going to be the first to raise from the dead and going to point to the people, the Jewish people. He said, and not only them, he's going to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. So what was it that Paul was saying to them? What is it that Paul was trying to, to, to get them to understand? Again, Paul is saying, I'm going to have you guys to argue with the word. That's why it's important for you to know the word of God. It is important for you to not argue with a person, but you stay with the word of God. Stay on to the word of God. Know what God's words say and stay on that. Let people argue with God's word. Don't you stand. God is not obligated to back up anything you say or I say, but God is obligated to back his word. So what was Paul saying? What was Paul saying? Again, Acts, um, let's look at this one more time before we spring to what God, I'm going to show you what God was doing. So Acts 26 and 20, um, you're looking, he's saying 23. He says that Christ should suffer. I'm, I, Paul is saying, I'm saying nothing but what the prophets have said, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should raise from the dead and should show light unto the people and the Gentiles. So he's saying not only to the Jewish people, but he's reaching out to the Gentiles. So what is he saying? I'll tell you what Paul was saying. Go with me to the book of Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah. So Paul, what he is doing, he said, no, I'm going to make y'all argue with the word of God. Isaiah, 53rd chapter. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. This is what Paul is saying. This is what Paul is getting at. This is what Paul is dealing with. And this is what they did not want to hear. Here is what they were upset with, and Paul was going to it. So Paul says, since you're mad, I'm going to give you something to really be mad about. Paul is saying, I'm going to really give you something 
to be mad about. I'm going to show you what it is that God wants you to see here. And so we're going to stand firm on God's word. Let's go there. So he's saying, again, um, Isaiah 50 and 3, he says, this is what he's saying. The prophets, God's going to die. He's going to be raised from the dead. He's going to speak to the Jews first, and then we're going to deal with the Gentiles. What is he saying? He says, whom, he says, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he should grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that he shall be, that we shall desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, an acquaintance with grief. And we had, and we had as it was our face from, and we hid as it was our face from him. He was despised and he was, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him smitten, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we were healed. All were like sheep has gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has lied on him the iniquity of us all. He was opposed, he was opposed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He, he is brought as a lamb before the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is dung, yet he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from the judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut out of the land of the living, and the transgression of my people was he smitten. For the transgression of the people, Jesus was beaten. You want to know why Jesus was killed? It's because the lies you tell. Why was Jesus killed? Because you laying up with somebody you ought not. Why was Jesus killed? Because you was doing those things you ought not do. And a perfect God cannot look on sin. So God had to have a veil between sin and for his righteousness. And that veil was named Jesus who is the Christ. And because of Jesus and everything he went through, God can now say, I can hear you when you come before me and pray. Because your prayers are not good enough. Your prayers are not strong enough. Your prayers can't reach high enough. So what Jesus says, as long as you are praying through Jesus Christ and him crucified, praying through the name of Jesus, Jesus, God says, now I can look on your prayers and answer those things. And so that's what he's saying. He said, and as he said, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his, in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, he had put him to grief. And when thou shalt make, make his soul an offering of, for sin, he shall say, See, see his seed and shall prolong his days and, ple and the pleasure of the Lord shall pro um, prolong his present the Lord shall prosper in his hands he shall see he shall see he shall he shall see uh, you know I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking something here saints do you see what God is trying to tell you here do you see why they're so angry with Paul. This is why the scribes and the Pharisees or the, the chief priests and the people, this is why they were so angry with Paul. Because Paul was saying, you don't need them. It is Jesus. It is people trying to tell you that you need them. There's people trying to tell you, you need this, this, this special water. You need this handkerchief. You need this cloth. You need to go to this place. No, all you need is Jesus. Why? Because God is showing here. God is showing here who he is. And the word says, he says, um, he shall see of the travailing of his soul and shall be satisfied by his, no by his knowledge shall my, shall my righteous servant justify many for, for he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and shall divide the spoils with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and, and he bared their sins. He bared the sins of many 
and made in, in intercession for the transgressor. So what Jesus is saying here, what Paul is saying, this is what the prophets was talking about. And that's what I have been proclaiming. That's why I keep telling you about Jesus. That's why I keep telling you there's no other way. You don't have to use the blood of bulls and goats no more. It's all about the blood of Jesus. So Paul is saying, I'm coming to you to show you this is what you need. This is what I have been proclaiming, clean Agrippa. This is what I'm talking about. And this is why they are so angry and mad. Why? Because I'm telling you, you don't need them anymore. How many churches, how many churches try to tell you without their church, you can't make it? How many preachers try to tell you only they have the, the formula of righteousness? How many people trying to tell you you're not good enough? Saints, do you see what it is? God is quite clear. Paul is showing them it is Jesus. So when you're looking at this scripture, again, when you're looking at Isaiah, and I said, when you're looking at Acts, the, the 26th chapter, this is what he is saying. So when you look at 23, he says that Christ should suffer. That's what he's talking about. Isaiah 50 and 3, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that he, the first that should raise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Jesus died like a dog. So the Jewish people, so the Gentile do not have to go to hell. The purpose that Jesus has laid before us, the thing that Jesus has given us, the things that Jesus has laid before us, saints, is the love so much so that John 3.16 is exactly what God is saying. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. Do you understand God is not there to beat you down? To God is not there to jump on you. God is there for one purpose. For whosoever call upon the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is not just a thing for your little clique or your group. We're the only ones saved. Me, my foe, and no more. That's the way people think. God says, no, no, no. I died that all may be able to have righteousness, have a right standing with God, and be able to go before darkness into light. Oh, but there are so many people that are looking at the situation and think it's all about them. It's going to go their way to do what they want to do, to do the things that they feel. But God says, no, no, no. The word says, um, as he look at it, he says, but he, again, as you look at it, he says, but he, again, this is the purpose of Jesus, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. What is iniquity? That sin that you did, and you tried to cover it up. I have said it, and I will continue saying it. Sin is like spilt milk on a carpet. Now, you may not know that it is there. You may can't see the stain, but let a little heat hit it. It's going to put a stench in the house, sour milk. It's going to put a stench in your house, and it's not going to get out of there until you clean that milk. Well, iniquity is that sin that you are indulged in and you think you can cover it up because don't nobody see, but God has eyes that goes to and fro and see everything. There's nothing that God doesn't see. There's nothing that God doesn't know. But because of Jesus, you can go before him and no matter what you did, no matter what you are doing, no matter what you may do, no matter what you said, no matter what you are saying, no matter what you may say, no matter what you are looking, no matter what you look at, no matter what you're looking at, no matter what you may look at, God says because of Jesus, because of Jesus, you can come before the throne of grace. You can come before the throne of grace in boldness and ask God for forgiveness. It's because of that you can get in. Jesus is the hall pass that can get you to the throne of grace. But the problem we run into is so many people tell you you don't need the hall pass. But when I was young and in school, one thing I've learned 
when we learned in school, before you went somewhere, you needed a hall pass. And if you did not have a hall pass and the teacher walked up on you, you was able to show the hall pass and you had a right to go wherever you was going. But if you did not have a hall pass, they immediately took you back to your class and the teacher dealt with you for going out of class. It's going to be a sad day on the day of judgment when so many people don't have the whole past known as Jesus. And on that day, God's going to have to escort them, the angels, going to escort them to an eternal hell, separated from God for their eternity. But if you have that whole past, that when the angels show up and want to know how is it that you should get into heaven, you are able to show them it is Jesus and him crucified. And the angels have no choice but to say, you have access in. But there are so many that don't want Jesus, but they want the whole past. Oh, Father, we thank you for the word that we have received, Lord, today. Do not let your word, Lord God, go void. But bless us, Lord, that we may take thy word and apply it to our lives. Oh, Father, I pray that something was said today that your saints may apply this to their life and find out exactly what is it that you want of them, for them. Lord, help us that we may hear the Spirit as he speaks to us, and we may apply, Lord, what he says to our life. Loving you every step of the way, Lord, that you may take the word and activate it in our lives, that it may cleanse the sin that may be in a thought form, that have gotten down in our heart, Lord, in the unforgiveness. And Lord, we have spoken through our mouth, may even be acting on it. So we plead the precious blood of Jesus that you bless us, Lord, that we're able to take thy word and apply it to our lives. Please, Lord, do not let your word go void. And we will forever, Lord, give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. Lord, for hearing this prayer, we're so careful to give your name the praise. This prayer we ask the Holy Spirit to deliver to the Father, for it is both in the name and under the blood of our Lord and our Savior, for you are Jesus. You are the Christ. Now, if you are out there today and something has been said that really touched your heart, you have heard the word and it has touched you and you now saying, I want to get my life in right standing with God. I want to give my life to Christ. I have good news for you. I can walk you through God's plan of salvation. Now, you may even be one that once knew him and you turned and walked away because you said so much hypocrite and, and so much junk in the church, but now you see that God is serious. Yes, people may play games, but God don't. And you said, I want to get myself back in line with God's word. I want to walk you through God's plan of rededication. Come, join hands with me. Pray, say, Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this door that is open before me. I take full advantage of this opportunity by walking through this door. I ask you, Father, forgive me for the life of sin that I have been living. Forgive me, Lord, for living your life my way. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life, sit on the throne of my heart, and I will serve you the rest of the days of my life. I right now, of my own free will, openly confess that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my King, and I choose to live my life according to your laws, your statutes, and your way. Rule my life, Lord, and I will serve you. I ask you, Lord, send the Holy Spirit in that he may navigate me as to where to go and what to do. And I'll forever give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of Almighty God. Welcome home. Now you ask the question, what do I do now? that I have given my life to Christ. Get in a good Bible-believing church, hear the word of God, and grow. If you don't know where one of those are at right now in your new growth, or you're not sure because you have been hurt, stay here with us. Stay here with us, and we'll teach you the word of God. You may say, well, okay, I want to come and visit you. Where are you located? We're located at 1851 Highway 66 South in Kernersville, North Carolina. You find just GPS and come here, and you'll be able to sit with it. You say, okay, then, I want to donate to the church or to the ministry. How do I do that? There's a QR code right here that you are able to go to our page, our channel, and you could use that QR code to be able to give. Every dime is used for the purpose and the kingdom of God's sake. We thank God for you. We look forward to seeing you right here on this page, right here on this channel, Sunday mornings. 
10 a.m. Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. We love you in Jesus' name. Be blessed.